too close. So you have to turn through the water, right? In the middle. Good, good. Good to see you. New York. Yeah. Oh, God. He shares a nice Cheney. 
My family and I own and operate here in Carnival Marinas. And I wanted to say a special thanks to Brad Wells, standing up here to my right, who organized this seminar as well as our, our full seminar series. He does an amazing job. He makes it all <laughs> He's come up with all this stuff and does an amazing job on this and other things and thank him very much. And again, thank you all very much for being here. I hope you enjoyed the seminar. I'm going to let Jeff Bowen take it away with the Salem Academy and uh, enjoy the learning. Take care. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, there we go. All right. Well, I guess you guys are uh, you're here and not sailing your boats offshore in the Caribbean. So, um, so hopefully, if I do a good job, like half this room will be empty by next winter, right? You guys will be down. So anyway, um, good morning. Good to see everybody here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit or a lot about you know um, offshore cruising. And uh, gosh, I've been doing it for about twenty years now, so I don't know everything, but I've kind of learned through. A lot of other captains, a lot of other folks and stuff that have really enjoyed. I mean, I love sailing in Chesapeake Bay, um, love sailing in the islands once you get down there, but I really enjoy getting away from the coast, getting past the inlet and getting out there. You don't have to worry about channel markers and shoals and lighthouses. It's just, man, it's just so nice being offshore. So I absolutely love it, and uh, it's just a wonderful experience. We started doing it with our, our whole family a um, long time ago. And um, my kids are really little, so we um, have kind of grown into it. And um, so I hope I'll give you some, some tips and useful stuff today. I'm going to talk about three things today. One is preparing yourself, getting yourself ready, um, yourself and your crew, and then also preparing your vessel. What do you kind of want to upgrade or put on your boat or, or check out um, you know, before you, you do some offshore sailing? And then um, lastly, just some skills, some skills you want to start building to prepare for, for doing more extensive cruising and, and, uh, and, and offshore sailing, okay? So let's, let's get started. If, um, let me see, is this thing gonna work here? There we go. All right, so here's just a nice calm day, <laughs> cruising around. Your boat's broken. Yeah, I couldn't get one of those straight up boats, you know, I got a crooked boat. Um, but this is nicely from the, the warmth and safety of, and dryness of my pilot house on a, on a rough day. So it's nice to have a, a pilot house on a boat. So um, if this, just watching this makes you a little bit queasy, there's a, there's a different seminar that you could go to. Um, <laughs> no, I was, um, we were heading off one time, having a, a goodbye party for us one night before we headed off to, um, to head down south. And we had some friends that were coming over and we had lots of food and we were up in the Potomac River, all the way up in a creek, tied to a dock on a catamaran. And I mean, not a ripple in the water, it was like zero wind. And we had some friends um, come aboard and, and, and this cute little lady, Mary, I just still remember, she sits down, she's like, oh, oh my, oh, oh, I'm like, it's like being on land. <laughs> Nothing's moving. So I just get a little seasonally, I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm like, well, okay, we'll visit, you can visit us when we get back. All right, so common question, what's the best yacht for blue water sailing? Um, people go through a lot of our classes at the Sailing Academy, and they start looking at boats, and, they're, and, and some guys will call me and go, hey, I found this great boat. Will this sail me across an ocean? And I'm like, well, it's the wrong question. Like, my answer to that is always the same thing, all right? A, um, it's kind of like asking me, hey, I found this really cool hammer. Will it build me a nice house? Okay. And, and the answer is like, you know, the, uh, a boat is a tool. You use it as a tool. I want to know who's swinging the hammer. Will it build you a nice house or not, okay? I want to know who's using that. Would you, would you sail um, across the ocean in that boat, all right? You might recognize it. It was sitting over here at Harrington on the hard for quite a while. That's Matt Rutherford's, um, it's Al, I guess it's Alba Vega. Um, and he sailed that around the Americas. All right, all the way around up through the Arctic, you know, down through the Antarctic, all the way around, you know, um, South America, and he set a record for doing it nonstop by himself. So just because a boat can do it or you can do it, do you want to? All right, 
And, and I don't really want to be on that boat offshore. God bless Matt. He's a skillful mariner, but um, I'm looking for a little bit more comfort than that. Um, so let's prepare, talk about preparing the captain and crew. Let's get you, you know, prepare. What can you do? Well, I'm prepare mentally, all right? Uh, build your knowledge. Build your sailing library. Build your, um, you know, look for stuff that's helpful. To go to seminars, talk to people. Um, but start building your knowledge for going out. And you also want your confidence in your ability, okay? You want to be confident. You don't want to go out, and, and, and there's a lot of unknowns out there. So try to alleviate as much as, as, much as you can. Um, you want to be confident, ready to go. And then crew trust, all right? You don't want to just prepare yourself, but who's going with you? Who's going to be crewing with you? My, um, my wife and I, one of our first times I had her out, she, um, she wakes me up. She's on watch. It's the middle of the night. She wakes me up. She goes, hey, I can't really tell what that is. Can you just come look at that thing for me? I'm like, yeah. And um, I'm looking at, like, you know, green, white, 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 red. And I'm like, hmm, that's the bow of a really big tugboat. <laughs> She's like, yeah, but where should we go? Like, I don't care. Either direction. <laughs> pick, a, pick a way to go and go hard, you know? So we uh, was like, why is he beeping at me five times? Because <laughs> you're in the way. Um, we're about to die. So then, you know, we, um, you know, I'd be on watch for a while, then she'd be on watch, and I would watch her while she's on watch. And, um, and I just couldn't sleep, you know. I, we had, I'm like, I, okay, well, first, you know, trip that was, was extensive for us, our big deal was like a three-day offshore trip. We did that, and, man, I was awake for three days. I couldn't sleep because I didn't have anybody born I could trust to sleep, you know, like, give, give me a break, right? And so oh, we just arrived exhausted, and we're like, look, we got to, we got to figure out a, way, a different way to do this because this, is, this isn't going to work. So you have to be able to trust your crew. Um, physically, you know, I mean, that boat's still tilting a whole bunch. Um, but, but first thing I want to deal with is, is balance, right? I mean, I've had some guys that were in, in re, you know, really young guys, really excellent shape go with me. And, and after a couple of days, they're just really sore because they're using different muscles um, just to steady and balance yourself the whole time. Okay, It's hard to work those things out. And uh, just, you know, it's kind of like if you had to, you know, crank up your house about 20 degrees and then try to walk around and do normal tasks, okay? Simple, normal things is difficult. We realize that, um, you know, getting down the hatch and, and, and getting through the cabin to the bathroom was, it was, it was quite a chore, you know? It's not, so, it's not so easy. So balance, sleep cycle. Can you, um, you know, the enemy of, being, of, of, of sailing is fatigue. You don't want to get overtired. You don't want to get fatigued. Can you reasonably sleep for three or four hours at a time, you know, and then be awake and alert and then, you know, um, rotate around the clock like that? Um, so work on your sleep cycle. I find that when I've been sailing a lot, um, I, most I can sleep is three or four hours at night and I'm getting up and I'm doing something and I'm going back to sleep. Uh, so think about that. Medical limitations, um, we could overcome a lot, but um, you know, what medications do you need? What are your, what are your limitations? Um, and then you know, get in shape. It's a very physical thing. I mean, you'll walk a little bit. Um, you know, just you know, try, I mean, I, you know, even I need to um, have some preparation before sailing season starts. I put on a few pounds over the winter time. But it's good to just be in shape. It's a very physical, physical thing being, being offshore. Um, experientially, um, here's some guys on a nice, beautiful day offshore. It's blowing about 35 knots, 40 knots. They're having like a great time, just, just having a blast. You have buckets of water poured over their head and just really enjoying themselves. Uh, crew for someone else. Here's some way to get some experience, all right? Find somebody else that's doing what you want to do and, and, and crew. There's a... There's a little asterisk because we've got a disclaimer. It should show up on the screen in a, in, in a minute that, you know, uh, your, your poor crew selection, we're not, Sailing Academy is not responsible for. We had a, well, we've heard some, some bad stories. Sometimes, like, going on crew finders goes, goes really wonderfully. But um, one of my friends who's, you know, the captain now, he sailed around the world, really great guy. But when he was first starting off, he didn't know a whole lot. And so he wanted to gain some experience. So he put his name out there on one of the crew finders, and he got hooked up with this um, you know, beautiful 60-foot yacht that was heading, um, heading down to Panama. And so they left the East Coast up here. And, you know, he just you know, signed on his crew, like, put his name out there and stuff. And, and so as, and it was just, you know, the, the, um, him, the, the husband and wife, and, and this gorgeous yacht they had just, just bought. So as they're leaving the coast through the inlet, the, um, the owner looks at him and he goes, um, all right, Captain, what's our course and our plan? 
<laughs> and my buddy just kind of blinks. He's like, um, I, I'm not a captain. <laughs> I'm here to help. I don't know. And the, and, and the owner looks at him and is like, you don't know what you're doing? And, the, and, and Roger looks at him like, you don't know what you're doing? <laughs> so it was a really rough trip to Panama. And um, after that trip, they kind of parted ways and vowed to never sail together again. <laughs> Um, so crew for someone else, but um, you know, free opportunities is sometimes worth the price you paid for it. Um, hire a captain. One of my um, first longer, I was going on a trip, and it was a little bit further outside of my comfort zone, um, places I hadn't been. You know, it was like a long time, you know, offshore. I just hired a, um, a professional captain to come along, and my boat, you know, my crew, and I just said, look, just be here. We can pretty much do everything, but just be aboard. It really, really helped us out. Um, and just gave me the peace of mind to, um, to do it. And then, you know, after that, we were good. We did, we did really well, and we were able to do a lot of trips. Uh, take an offshore course. We do um, offshore courses, mostly between here and the Bahamas. Um, and you, know, you can join on one of our, our school boats that are set up for offshore sailing and see what the equipment we use and stuff. Um, if you're, we do have commercial break. We, I think we might have a spot or two left for our, our spring trip. We've got a trip coming from, from the Bahamas back up here. Um, and there's our disclaimer, joining other crew, join other crews at your own risk. The sailing can be, may not be held liable for poor choices in captain or crew. <laughs> Preparation of vessel. Um, here's Gamzu. It's what we use for our offshore training boat. We've got about 10 boats in our fleet. Um, it's a, she's a great boat to, to sail. Um, if I'm going off in the Chesapeake, I want a different, different boat to sail. It's a little bit more, more maneuverable and nimble. But for preparation of vessel, let's look at structural integrity first, all right? Um, this isn't something you can actually fix on your current boat, but if you're upgrading, you want to, might want to look at some of the, the features as far as how it's built. And um, you might have heard about there's a, a Beneteau 40, uh, Chiki Rafiki, Mid-Atlantic, um, it's kind of missing something. Anybody want to guess what it's missing? I mean, besides being like wrong side too, right? It's, uh, it's missing that keel thing. And that uh, keel fell off, all right? And unfortunately, all four passengers were, um, were lost. Um, the keel fell off. It was right off the, um, the East Coast, the United States, probably. Uh, I think it was off of North Carolina, somewhere around Hatteras. And um, so they, they, you may have heard about them. That happened not too long ago. But I don't know if you, you heard about the Bavaria that lost its keel, um, Bavaria 39, or the Oyster 82, or the Far X2, or the Bavaria Map 2, or the Fast 42, or the Genoa 37, or the Vanderstadt 45, or the Sweden Yachts 42, Maxi 110, Max Fun 35, Comet 45, or the Davidson 50. Um, that was from Yachting World um, magazine. They, they surveyed about 72 cases of boats uh, losing their keel offshore. Seems like it's becoming more and more of a common thing. The cases aren't getting less, they seem to be growing. And one of the reasons is that the fin keels have become more and more popular, kind of moving, they're, they're faster, they're more performance oriented, but... Um, um, these are all fin keels. I think so, yes. Yeah, all these guys are fin keels. If you look at some of the older boats, well, we'll look at a couple things here. Let's look at um, keel and rudder design. Um, this is mostly what we get. I've got a lot of boats that look like this. And um, you've got the, the fin keels right down here, and you've got the keel bolts sitting here. So, um, and also a spade rudder. Your spade rudder is not protected at all, all right? People lose their rudders all the time offshore. And um, so just be aware, the, um, you know, have your keel bolts inspected, but there's a lot of force. If you were to hit like something offshore, or a shipping container or something. There's a lot of those floating around. Never look at the stats of how many shipping containers are lost every year. It's just uh, frustrating. So if anything hits here, you know, the force on those, that, that front keel bolt, um, the front few keel bolts is really, really strong. So this is kind of the modern yacht that they're building now. And yes, they do perform much better. They go to weather better, they, um, and they're a lot faster. But there are some limitations here. If you look at kind of the older style that people used to, to go back and cruise on in the you know, 70s and 80s. This is a, a modified full, um, a modified because it's cut out back here. A full keel would come all the way back. But, um, but you see the attachment points are all the way along a good portion of that, of that hull. 
And the rudder has a protected ske a skeg. So it's a skeg hung ru um, rudder. It's protected. Nothing is going to strike the rudder. It's going to hit that first. Um, also, lines and stuff will not, will not um, snag on it like it'll snag on this rudder here. It'll pick up lines and all kinds of things if you, if you do run over some things. So um, this is the style that, that we use for offshore sailing. And it doesn't mean you can't take a boat like this offshore. Just know its limitations. And um, really wanted to do some, some um, uh, real careful weather routing and weather forecasting, which we'll get into in a little bit here. So rudder and keel design, um, safety gear, offshore um, life, um, life jackets with harnesses. I brought one of the ones we use. Um, a lot of different brands out there that are good. Uh, I use uh, spin locks and uh, it's got an integrated harness inside of here. It has also has, so you're, you're tethered in the whole time. It um, inflates, has a, well, you'll, you'll see a picture of what happens when it inflates here in a second. But it also has the HRS hydrostatic release so that if for some reason you lose your keel and the boat turns over, you can pull that and get out of it in, in a hurry if you need to. But you want to stay attached to your boat most of the time. So these are great. Um, Let's look at, there it is. Got a picture of it right here. Once it inflates, it's really cool. It's got a lifting strap to pull you out of the water. Um, integrated harness lifting strap. Um, I should have shown you there, but it does have the leg straps. It comes around um, underneath your, your, your crotch. It also has, if you look at the, um, the hood, it has a spray hood that goes over your head and um, locks in place. That way you can take waves over and still breathe. That's kind of a big, team, big thing. Um, it also has the loom on where the whole thing will light up at night. It's not just a little light. It does have a light on it that comes up, but it also has the loom on, so the whole thing will glow. It's very easy to see these at night. Okay? <laughs> what are them um, <laughs> this one is, we happen to sell them at the Sailing Academy. <laughs> Um, basically, because we buy them, we use them all for our courses. Everybody take a course here, everybody gets a spin lock. You know, they're not the offshore version. We do the deck vest for the bay. Yeah. We use these for going offshore. This one is 409. So um, don't skimp on your life jacket. You, you wear it and uh, make sure it's got a great harness. Um, I'm hang, hanging by my harness a lot for, for different, different stuff we're doing. I have a question on the harness. Yes. Are they shying away from the metal ones? Because I see that doesn't look like it's they do have a webbing loop on that thing. Okay. Yes, oh, okay. Okay. it's got a, it's that that big webbing loop. It's not a, it's not a metal, right? But it's all it's all webbing. Okay. okay. Um, I still we still have some of the ones with the metal clips and stuff on them. We still use those uh, tethers with um, with release. I showed you showed you the the hydrostatic um, release there. This one doesn't have a, a release to it. So if you have the old style tether. If you clip this in and the other end is clipped into you and you need to get out, you're hanging by that harness, you have to be able to lift your body weight to unclip that hook, okay? That's the reason for the hydrostatic release, to be able to pull and get free of that harness if you have to, okay? I've never had to break free of a harness. On my life jacket, I always carry a knife or a cutter so I can cut that harness away too if I have to. Never had to do that, but I have been hanging on that thing for um, and, and appreciating how, how strong it is. Um, also, jack lines. You want to set jack lines up on your boat. Um, again, these are kind of things I'll put on the boat before we go offshore. I rarely will use jack lines in the Chesapeake Bay unless I'm teaching a class on, on how to set things up. But you want to run them from your cockpit all the way to the bow. And then anytime you go forward, it doesn't matter how nice of a day is, it is. You go ahead and click in and walk forward with your, with your, um, your, your harness and your tether to that jack line. When um, I get to a boat or we're doing a delivery or something, we'll bring our own, um, just because a lot of times they're not, a boat's not equipped with them. Make sure it's webbing and not line. I've gotten to boats before and they said, oh yeah, we got jack lines. And they were, you know, um, line or rope, rope jack lines. If you step on a rope, it'll roll, okay? If you step on a webbing, it'll be flat, okay? And it won't roll, so um, you won't, it won't send you overboard. Um, when we, you might see some pictures on them, when we run them, we twist them like that all the way down our deck, okay? You still step on it, it'll flatten out, 
all right? But um, with wet hands and wet gloves, it's really hard to pick up a flat webbing that's laying on the deck that's soaking wet, okay? So twist them so you can pick them up and hook into them really quickly, all right? Um, so good jack lines. Um, mass pulpit, AKA granny bars. Again, none of our boats have this, these except for ones I'm gonna take offshore, okay? And there's a picture of granny bars right there. And, um, or your mast pulpit, and when I'm doing mast work, it's sure nice to wedge yourself into that thing and be able to do what you have to do. We were, this a uh, couple months ago, as um, offshore, we lost our mainsail, and so we were up there trying to pack it back into the bag, and yeah, stuff breaks, right? So we're, uh, <clears throat> our mainsail track blew up, and so we lost our main. We're trying to save the, as much of the material as we can. We're packing it in the bag, and I'm up against that thing, just you know, putting all my weight against that, and just really happy to have be nice and secure. And as I pulled back, one of these posts came out right here, and I had specifically told one of the guys before we left the trip, I said, okay, and our staff, and I'm like, hey, make sure you put new set screws in my granny bars, and they're nice and tight. And I was leaning back, and it came undone. I almost died because he didn't listen to what I said. <laughs> had to fire him. Um, no. Nah. Um, sea anchor or drogue, I've carried one for years. I've never been in any weather bad enough where I thought, you know, I'm gonna quit sailing and put out my sea anchor. But um, it's worth to have for peace of mind, um, especially if you're gonna be offshore for more than you know, a week um, or two, and you, um, <clears throat> um, you know, you're, gonna, you're gonna be out there for a while. You can't really control your, your weather window so much. If it's, a, if it's under a week trip, then I wouldn't see you really need one, but it's, it's good to have for peace of mind. It's like parking your boat, and in a big, big storm with breaking waves, it'll hold you bow to until, until the storm is over. Um, all right, a drogue is something you drag from the back of your boat to slow you down as you go down the face of the wave. You don't want to go down super fast and bury the bow into the wave in front of you, so um, it will stop you from planing quite so fast as you go down the face and it's not quite as, like a sea anchor, it's not as big, sometimes they're smaller, but you can use lines or warps or dock lines to drag them off the back of your boat too. So I, I do carry a drogue with me. Um, EPIRB um, and a PLB, here's an EPIRB, it'll give, you a, 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 give everybody a, a position if you get in trouble, you can pop that thing. This is a, a PLB personal locator beacon. Um, I don't have the upgraded version, I don't have this one, uh, Garmin makes a great one too. I've got the older version um, of, of this. And the nice thing is I can push a little button and it will send, um, and I can set it up to, to send a, a signal out and it'll shoot a message through email or through text to anybody that I type in on the, on the app um, online. It's a subscription service and it costs you know, a couple hundred bucks a year, but it's well worth um, my, my wife knowing where I am as I'm trekking along somewhere. So um, this one, the upgraded version, you can text, you can send messages and receive messages, which is really cool. Um, and it's much cheaper than getting like a sat phone or something. So um, I like having the PLB. The, the, um, the EPIRB is great, but it's a single use item, all right? Uh, if you, you're either gonna pop it off or not pop it off, and that's an SOS or a, a Mayday situation where you're imminent loss of life or imminent loss of vessel. So I've never popped mine off. It just kind of sits there on the boat doing nothing, um, waiting for me to have a catastrophic failure of some kind. This thing I can use for communicating um, when everything's great, you know, um, just to say hi or maybe get a weather report update or something. Yeah, but you know anybody that's using Starlink yet? Yeah, yeah, people are using Starlink, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, they've got an offshore version, you know, they've got yeah, a marine version. Um, I don't know, I haven't used it, so I can't speak to how great it is, but what I've heard, people are getting the, the mobile version and not the expensive offshore version, and the mobile version seems to work, but don't take my word for that. <laughs> okay, all right, so. Um, I, I don't have, I, not enough to be able to talk about them, okay, so, but I think it's a great, great, great option. Um, so offshore, and, offshore men, men overboard equipment, okay? Yeah, in the Chesapeake Bay, if we have those little cushions, we're compliant, and the Coast Guard goes, good. But if you're offshore, you throw that thing overboard, you'll never see your little floaty <laughs> device again, and probably not your crew member, okay? You need something that you can see in waves that are big, 
Um, so this is a mom, um, and it's a man overboard module. It sits on your rail, and you pull that thing, and um, what that does is it inflates and sends it over. So it's weighted on the bottom, so this big, huge pole-like thing sticking up there. I, I don't have um, this version. I've got a normal man overboard pole. It's a solid pole that sits on the back of my boat where you can send that over. It has a flag on it and stuff, and it has the lights and everything else. But I don't have to maintain it. This thing you have to repack and make sure you, um, you have the CO2 cartridge replaced every, every so often. But uh, make sure you um, upgrade your, man, your offshore equipment, man overboard equipment. Um, extra bilge pumps. I like having a really big bilge pump on my boat. This thing drains your batteries a whole bunch, so I won't put it on a float switch. I'll have a small little one to get little water that comes in the bilge, kind of pump that out, and then have an emergency pump I can also flip by manual switch, the big one I'm on. I've got about, on the boat we usually um, do our offshore training on, we have about five ways to get the water out of the boat, okay? And that's one of the first rules of sailing is keep the water on the outside, all right? If you, um, you always have a manual one, and if you really want to go old school, you always want to have an extra bucket around, okay? <laughs> so <clears throat> that's the OG bilge pump right there, a big old, big old bucket. Um, <clears throat> all right, so life raft. You know, I don't carry a life raft in the Chesapeake Bay. You know, I can probably get in my dinghy and get to shore if I really have to, okay? Uh, or and there's so many boats around, someone's going to pick you up, but once you go offshore, really consider having a life raft. Uh, this is a, a serious version that they make, smaller ones that are coastal, and you want to kind of size your life raft according to how many crew you have, and then how far you're going. What do you really need? Uh, you don't need a uh, across the ocean life raft if you're just coastal cruising down to uh, down to Florida or the islands or something. Um, but you do want to have one aboard. It's important. They, uh, um, we've, I've seen a lot of catamarans, Catamarans, if you kind of talk about those, a lot of folks with catamarans, or some people won't carry one because there's no keel, there's no lead weight, all right? And it's just kind of like a big surfboard with foam and fiberglass. It's gonna float even if it's inverted, it's gonna float, okay? Um, that's great, so they'll, they figure it's better to stay with the boat than go into a, get in a life raft, which I agree as long as it's floating, but um, nothing is impervious to fire. It could still burn up and sink. All right, so um, that's, you know, I would always recommend going with, with a life raft. Okay, so um, navigation equipment, paper charts and plotting tools, get good at this. Uh, practice your, your plotting skills, turn off um, the electronics, okay, and practice your plotting. I carry paper charts for everywhere I go, and we plot our courses on them, okay? And a lot of times we'll do it because we're, you know, I have to because we're, we're doing a class, but it's really, really good practice. If your electronics go down, then you want to be able to know, first of all, where you are and be able to navigate back safely back to, back to land. Um, and they're not expensive, right? Get yourself some, you know, good, good parallel rulers and some dividers. Um, see, and this won't happen, okay? Um, this is unfortunate. Um, and these aren't weekend sailors. These are professionals, okay? You might have heard about this. The issue was they're using a chart plotter. And the thing about chart plotters, you can zoom out, okay? But you lose resolution. So they had their chart plotter zoomed out, and it lost the resolution of the reef that was under the water they didn't see. So it looked great on their chart plotter. And the cool thing about my paper charts, you can't zoom out, all right? The reef stays there, all right? You can look at it and go, oh, reef, we should go around that, not over top, all right? And, you know, of course, their rudder is pretty much gone there, you know, or their um, keel's gone too, and all kinds of stuff. So chart plotter, they're, they're fantastic. We use them. Um, I usually have, on, on our boat, we've got um, like two of them. Got one up at the helm, one down below, so you're kind of monitoring things from anywhere on the boat. But don't... Um, don't super um, re don't rely on them only, all right? You, wanna, um, you want um, other sources of being able to navigate if, if your electronics do go down. Um, AIS, Automatic Identification System. This is fantastic. I, you know, I always look back in the days when we sailed without it going, huh, I never knew there were so, much, so, so many things around me at sea because you can't see very far over the horizon. So I just took this little clip. Um, 
Uh, yesterday, from the, the online version of the AIS, you can pull up all the boats around. And you can see coming out of the Chesapeake Bay, like, man, there's a lot of boats. You won't see all of them, okay? Um, especially at night or in, or in fog or something, but they're there. So it's fantastic knowing exactly where they are, all right? And um, the AIS receiver, this is, that's an image from marinetraffic.com. You can get apps if you don't want to install the AIS on your, on your boat. You can get apps with it. The problem with the apps are um, that they're not exactly in real time, all right? They're taking the information, they're sending it out over, you know, from satellite information, they're sending it out um, to you over the internet, um, and it's not in real time. It can lag behind by several minutes. Um, so many minutes that you could have already hit something before they tell you exactly what boat. What? That's true, yeah, yeah. Well, and it's, yeah, exactly. Right, right. So um, I recommend, it's really important to have one. I like the, the, you know, the ones that are being read by, you get the satellite ones, but I like the ones being read by the VHF. So what it's doing is collecting data from boats that are around you, all right, bypassing the whole satellite system, okay? And it tells you exactly where they are and their trajectory, and then you can get the information on them too. Question. Uh, yes, question? No, oh, okay. Um, so I love the AIS, the um, radar, is, is fantastic to have too. Um, it's a power hog, all right? So man, it just really draws down your battery bank, but it's great to have at night, especially making landfall, all right? It'll help you find that, you know, that island or that place you're, you're going. Um, and obviously it will help see, you know, other, other vessels around you. Um, not every boat is broadcasting on AIS, okay? So you might miss something, and, um, but the radar is gonna pick up you know, pretty much every vessel out there, all right? And it's guys, you can, you can track storms in your local area too with, with, with radar. And uh, I've sailed a lot without it, but it's really nice to have. Um, adequate seabirds, all right? That's a lee cloth, so um, when you're tilted over, it's sure nice to have something to lean against. Um, you know, you don't hear these thud in the middle of the night where guys rolling out of their bunks, okay? <laughs> Here is uh, Captain Finn properly demonstrating a seabird, all right, with, uh, with a lee cloth on it. So on our boat, we've got like five or six of them all set up in separate bunks and stuff, which is kind of cool. So we sleep really well offshore. Um, but again, you probably don't need something like that in the Chesapeake Bay. Grab rails. This is old style, um, you know, yacht. You can see these really nice grab rails up on top of that boat on the ceiling. So you can walk the full length of the boat, right? And if you haven't been offshore a whole lot, you're like, oh, those are really nice decorations, all right? <laughs> and, and then you get off in a seaway, you're like, how am I gonna navigate through this cabin? <laughs> you're like, I need something to hold on to. And uh, here's a nice boat. A friend of mine was buying this model, and um, he, he kind of pokes his head down the companion way, and he asked the broker, he's like, um, in a seaway, how, how do I get through the cabin to the front? And, and, and the broker's answer was, um, well, when it gets rough, you pretty much just stay in the cockpit, you know, the whole time. <laughs> really? For like a week? You know what, I'm not gonna go to the bathroom, you know? <laughs> so there are no grab rails on that boat. That's amazing, and here's a, here's a newer style boat with still no grab rails. I guess you gotta make it to your compression post somehow, and you kinda have to, you know, get a good balance in between waves, then run and grab a hold of it real quick, okay? Um, which is dangerous, all right? You know, you, I had um, a scar on my heel for, you know, those last couple of months has finally, you know, healed up. And just from not having a, a correct handhold and getting thrown across a cabin. So install grab rails, handholds. Um, we put several of them on at different places uh, to make it easy. Sail inventory. Um, does anybody carry storm sails with them? Any, nobody has storm sails? I've carried them, I've never actually used them. One of the reasons is on, on our boat, I have a, a cutter rig, and so my, my staysail is my storm sail, okay? I can drop everything else down, fasten everything, I just use that one sail, and it works great. So I've carried them, I've never deployed them. So um, it's worth having. Um, you're never gonna complain that your storm sail's too small. Too small. You're like, gosh, I wish that thing was bigger. No, you're really, it's really nice to have them. Um, but if you're doing proper weather forecasting and you're just sailing up and down the East Coast, you, you probably will never deploy them. You see that they've stripped all the other sails off the boat, okay, when it's really that rough. 
Just the windage on your sail and your main sail and your stack pack or your sail cover will make a huge difference. So if it's that bad, you probably want to strip everything off, put it down below, put your storm sails on. So I recommend instead of if you have a, you know, you're looking at, you know, budget wise, what do you want to put money into? I would recommend, you know, putting some, some money into a, a light air sail. All right. I'm going to be sailing in as fair of weather possible. And I find myself using my cruising chute. Um, this is a, a Jenniker or an asymmetrical spinnaker. Uh, I'll find myself using that a lot more um, because I want to sail in more, more settled weather, okay? And I will run my engine a whole lot less if I have that sail, okay? Uh, here, this, in fact, there's mine. It's nice and pretty, okay? Kind of some patriotic sail cover. Um, so it's on a sock. You got cut off at the top there. You can't see it. It's super easy. I can set it up by myself. I can put, click the autopilot on and set it up, and no problem. I really don't need anybody else. So it's helpful to have another set of hands. But on a proper spinnaker, I sail a lot with spinnakers. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about you know the pole and the guy and the you know the downhaul, the uphaul, and all that stuff, right? It's got like five or six lines going to one spinnaker. Okay, and you need a lot of a full crew to, to handle that, but. These are very easy for a, um, for a, a, for a couple to, to handle. And so I sail under that a whole lot. One question. Yeah. Uh, any comments on furling sails? And yeah, like a code zero will be a furling sail. The problem with them is you can't leave them in place, okay? Um, once you, because they're made of very, very light material, right? So, and, and it will all furl up. You can't put a UV cover on it. Um, you could rig up a, and I've seen people do it, where you rig up like a, a sock with another halyard that will pull up and cover it, right? But you can't leave it in place. You kind of, if you have to drop it um, while you're sailing in heavy weather or stronger winds, you still have to hoist it up and then you can unfurl it, all right? So whether I unfurl this way or pull the sock up this way, it's not a whole lot more work, okay? So, um, but I do, I do like them. I've sailed with the Screecher a lot. Which is um, which is like, like a, a big it's like a cross between a Jenniker and a um, and a Genoa, and it was on a furling furling line, and uh, still it didn't have the UV cover on it, so we had to we had to take it down every so often just to make sure it wasn't getting baked in the sun, deteriorating. Uh, but care for them, you have to you have to care for them. Um, okay, so upgrade char your charging system and battery. Now you put all these power hog items on your boat, and you find out oh I got to keep my engine running the whole time just to power my um, my steering system, my autopilot, my, um, my radar, I got to you know, power my chart plotters, and all that stuff takes power. So um, upgrade your, your charging system accordingly. I have put, I've got, I think, three, three solar panels on, on our other boat we use now for offshore. I used to, we used to live on a catamaran. We had six solar panels up because we had lots of surface area up on the Bimini up there. But I've, I usually will carry as much as I can put up there, and, and we've had you know wind, wind generators; those help. You can you can get the the water gens that will um, has like a like a leg that goes down to the water, and it will it will generate some power for you, um, or at least put a couple extra batteries on board and um, upgrade your alternator too, so you can go for a couple days without having to run your engine. Okay, you'll find you know watch your meter because man, those those things really take a, take a lot of power. Self-steering, these are fantastic. Uh, I used to have a, the monitor, I guess a monitor wind vane. Uh, it's, it's mechanical, not electrical, so it doesn't burn any power. And um, they're, they're great, but they're bulky, and then they kind of get in the way of your davits and where you put your dinghy. So there's some, there's some challenges, but they're, they're fantastic to have. I've always wondered how, what's, on what principle do they work? That they it's a, it's a wind vane, so this piece right here goes down to the water and works like a separate rudder. So you're basically going to you know, either lock your rudder in place or some will, will connect to your rudder and work in tandem with it. Um, and then they have a, another piece that's not attached that goes up to the top, which is a, um, like a, a wind vane. That's why they call them a wind vane. So the wind is blowing against that thing, and you, what you do is you set it for a certain point of sail. Okay? You set it for like a, you know, a, a close reach or something. And it will maintain that close reach for you because it maintains that angle to the wind, all right? And that's, that's how me mechanically it works. So you can reset it up to maintain any, any course. Now, it's not going to hold a compass course for you, so it makes navigating a little bit different, all right? So, um, but, but again, offshore, we don't see the major wind shifts that we see like in the Chesapeake Bay. You could, you'd set that up, you'd go, go to sleep, and granted, you'd be off course by a, a somewhat, but 
you acknowledge that, but it basically keeps you yes. in a certain direction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and just, you know, or who's ever on watch, I wouldn't say, I don't, I, I personally don't like going to sleep with my boat yeah. sailing by itself. <laughs> so we'll usually have somebody watching what's going on. And watching doesn't mean hand steering. It just alleviates you from having to stand behind the helm the whole time. Okay? Um, and you can navigate and adjust it as you need to, but it just makes, makes it a whole lot easier than having to hand steer the whole place. Like, I, I told you, we, we lost our mainsail um, on, on a trip down to the islands in the, um, in the fall. Well, we also, we also lost our, our, our steering, um, or our, our autopilot. We, didn't lose, we lost the autopilot. We had a hand steer. Uh, we lost our mains. We had other sails that we were sailing with. And then our chart plotters went down, you know, and everyone was like, what do we do? I was like, well, you just steer this thing, you know? And <laughs> you're going to have to. And, and the, the fact is, it was, it was actually fantastic because um, we had to use our navigation skills and um, nobody was steering on their watches. I'm like, look, click the autopilot off, steer on your watches. And once the autopilot went down, everybody had to steer. And that, they said that was the most memorable part of the trip because they had to learn to hold a course. And, you know, I, it, was, it was a little rough when everybody's kind of hand steering because, you, you know, I'm trying to tell them, okay, you, you can go around the wave. You don't have to go through it, you know? I mean, I'm in my bunk, it's like, bang! You know, it's like, oh, you know, it's, you don't have to drive the bus through the mountain. You can go around, you know? <laughs> and, um, so they had a fantastic, we all had a great time hand steering and maintaining course and stuff. So it's really, really um, helpful. Um, okay, so navigation. Work on your navigation skills. We talked about that a little bit. Take a class. ASA 105 is a, is, is a classroom where it's, it's only dealing with, um, with, with paper charts, navigating, plotting, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's a hard class. It's like a three-hour test at the end. But if you can pass that exam, you'll do really, really well um, navigating on your own. Have, have good tools and equipment. We talked about that. Practice. Turn off your chart plotter, okay? Practice in the Chesapeake Bay. Get, um, you know, I, it's amazing how many years I spent sailing before I had a chart plotter. Now you're like, oh my gosh, how would we go to sea without one, right? You're just so reliant on the electronics. But it's great to just click it off and practice your skills and see if you can, um, if you, if you can get where you, where you want to go. I was doing a, a 105 um, class with um, a couple guys who were, who were physics teachers and uh, physics professors. They taught college level physics. And um, man, brilliant guys. And so I'm doing the teaching the navigating and stuff, and this is down in the down the islands, and um, and they they showed me their their work and stuff, and they have all these formulas and figures and all this stuff and everything else. We're going to be on this course here because of then I'm, I'm looking at I'm lost. I have no idea what they're talking about, right? And I'm like, well, this is it looks great. Um, it's really really impressive, but I would like you to do I'd like you to alter your course about 20 degrees to starboard. And they're like, no, no, that'd be wrong because of this. And they go through the whole thing again, and I'm like, well. Yeah, I'd still like you to alter course and start at about 20 degrees. And they're like, no, this is, we, we've gone through this several times and our math is right. I'm like, look, I, I'm not going to argue with your math. What, I, what I'm going to argue with is that, is, the, is that coral head that we're going to run into if we keep going this way. And they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, you can overthink stuff, but good, get good at practicing and matching up with what you see on the, on the paper charts with what's going on around you. Uh, build your library. Um, you might not want to get into celestial navigation, but... I mean, if you get a, a, a you know a simple um, you know some simple equipment, get a sextant, get the books and stuff. You can just have them aboard there. If for some reason all your electronics go down, you're lost at sea. You have all the time in the world to study. <laughs> <laughs> and um, study and practice transiting inlets. I like sailing in the Chesapeake Bay and some parts of the ICW, but man, you know, and I like being in the ocean. But those little squeezy parts between the two. They get really, really hairy, you know? And I didn't know that until you started going through one. You're like, how come we're not making any progress? And you know, the current is just ripping right through because you take two big bodies of water and then you put a little choke point in between and man, that water rips through there super, super fast, okay? So practice transiting inlets. If you ever have like a, you know, opposing sea and current, man, you just gotta be careful of that because they'll stack up really, really, you know, um, big behind you or in front of you, okay? Um, go on YouTube, look over, you know, just, just Google, you know, um, 
I don't haul over inlet. That's a fun one to watch, right? <laughs> See lots of boats getting swamped and sinking, and they're, you know, it's a beautiful day too, right? It's a nice day. Everybody, you're cruising in nice calm water. They're getting the inlet. All of a sudden, blah 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 blah. <laughs> so practice. There was, uh, Steve Doge had a book out, Inlets on the East Coast, and he had like the the routes and everything. I haven't seen that in a while, and I haven't seen an updated copy. I've got an old copy of it, but um, it was really helpful transiting and planning the different inlets and stuff. We. We had um, one time my, my wife was pregnant. We were down in um, you know the, off the coast of Florida, and 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 she started having some false contractions. And she's like, "Hey, it's getting you know it was a nice day. We started to pound a little bit." She's like, "Can can you get me in?" And I'm like, "Well, I don't know. I like class A inlets. I don't like the small ones, you know." And um, I'm looking on my charts, and there was you know Boca Raton inlet was there. I'm like, "Well." We could try some small, kind of big rocks on your side and, you know, following sea. So, you know, and she's like, if you don't get me, we're going to have this baby. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so we, um, we had to, yeah, really, which one's better? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Kid, crash boat on rocks. Kid, crash boat, I don't know. <laughs> so you know, as we're coming in, you know, there's a big wave behind me. and kind of surfing in. The boat turns sideways, and we kind of made it around. And, and then as you make that turn, it's like a 90-degree turn as you go in the inlet of Boca Raton. There's a drawbridge right there, right? And they weren't responding. I'm like, hey, Boca Raton, huh? I'm coming in. <laughs> can, can I get an opening? You know, no response. Boca Raton, I didn't, didn't, didn't copy. Uh, I'm still coming in. <laughs> so just as we zoomed down this way, we made that turn, and, and that bridge um, person was opening up, and I went flying through, and I'm like, I'm really glad they were open. That's, that made my day. And I'm like, thank you very much, Boca Raton. Appreciate the opening. Um, what was that? Yep, is that one a bad one? I haven't been through there. Oh, yeah, Manasquan, yep, okay, gotcha. If you look at, at this, um, you see that's by an inlet. You can see the, uh, the wave hitting the, uh, or the current hitting that buoy and uh, that can, and you can see the tail behind it. If you're looking at tails behind this, that's a, that's a great sign. Yeah, you see them leaning over, and you're like, hmm, okay. Um, so navigating, practice your navigating, work on your navigating. Uh, weather forecasting and weather routing, all right? This is a skill you really want to get good on, good at. We kind of live and die by the weather. Um, gather trusted sources, okay? What do you use now, all right? And um, build those. Talk to other sailors, what apps they like, what, um, what information they get, what sources. Uh, learn to read the weather facts charts. And, uh, you know, this is, this is one I took, a snapshot of a weather facts chart I took uh, two days ago. Took this on Thursday, and you go, wow, that looks fantastic. A nice high pressure, so a nice gentle south wind. I can sail up the coast right here or leave the islands and head north, and that's going to be great. I'll have some nice weather for a while. And... Um, you know, it doesn't have the, the flags on here to tell you how, how, how much is, but you can kind of tell that you're going to have a, some really nice, gentle southeast winds, you know, up along this area, like right in here. And the uh, barometric pressure is not too, you know, too bad. The, um, the gradients are nice and far apart. These are like, like a topographical map, right? If you're looking at a topographical map and you see those gradients really close together, you've got a steep climb, you know, or a strong descent. So this tells me that it's nice, wide, easy sailing. Um, but for yesterday, you guys might have noticed some wind blowing yesterday and this morning, right? Did you guys, you guys notice that? Well, in one day, it went from that to this. And now you've got a gale blowing along the East Coast, and it's blowing 35, right? So, um, you know, if you had made your decision based on the previous, um, previous chart, then uh, and expecting that to hold for a while, that, that window kind of collapsed and that big cold front is coming through, and you kind of notice the temperature drop from yesterday to today, right? Nice and warm yesterday morning, temperature drop, got a little bit of rain pushed through, and, uh, and that's what's happening with this low pressure system dragging that, that cold front through. So, you know, learn all these symbols and know what they mean. Um, these little, you know, um, arrows are pointing the direction the wind's going. Uh, each one of these little feathers or feathers on there is 10 knots of breeze, so that's 35, half a feather. Um, if you get up here, you should realize up here it's getting, getting pretty gnarly. It's like, you know, 35, 40, um, 40 knots up here. And then once it goes to 45, 
Then you'll start getting a flag up like this guy. That means 50. So if you start seeing the flags, you might want to wait a day or two to go out. Um, but yeah, get, yes. Yes. What, the, the numbers in the little boxes, 1016, 1030. Those are, are your, the, the barometric pressure. These guys right here, okay? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Okay, barometric pressure is right here. You can kind of see you have a high pressure. It's a little bit less, 1016. But if you go up here, all right, um, you can see it's a lot lower, all right? And what will happen is you have a low pressure and it will go out. So between here and there, you've got quite a difference in the barometer, all right? And so that's why all these little lines are so close together. So you're going to have a lot of weather right between these two systems. The low pressure system is spinning counterclockwise. High pressure system is, is spinning clockwise. So between the two, the wind will kind of funnel like that. You don't want to be right there, okay? Um, learn to read your barometer. I was going to put a put a, a, a slide in here. Um, my watch will keep track of the barometric pressure over time. And um, we were preparing for a storm. And um, you could just see, the, it has a graph over the last several hours. And you could just see my graphs like this, and it goes, kunk, you know? <laughs> like, when you see that, you're like, mm, it's time to reef down. So <laughs> log your barometric pressure. All of your... Um, all of your weather forecasts are fantastic, but it's only a forecast, all right? Somebody is taking information and kind of guessing what's going to happen next. And in most cases, it's an educated guess, but it's not a definite. So what your bar barometer is doing will tell you what's happening right now. So have a ship's barometer, um, log it every hour, right? and then people are on watch. At the end of their watch, they're going to log the barometric pressure so we can watch trends. What you're looking for is trends. Um, and you get used to doing that, even if you've got good weather practice, match what you're seeing up on your boat and with your equipment with what the forecast is telling you. Uh, get some means of receiving weather offshore. Um, spot tracker, I put that in here because you can get texts. You can have people text you with forecasts, all right? And you can be outside VHF range, all right? That's, that's from satellite. Um, Iridium Go, this is another great system. You can hook the Iridium Go up to, your, up to your laptop, and you can download grid files and get those weather facts charts, okay? Um, it's, uh, it's those, so I think the spot track, I think that one's like about 500 bucks. Um, Iridium Go, to set that up for your, the offshore system, it's about, I don't know, I think it's up to like about 1,000 bucks for the system to get it, get it going. Um, I carry a single sideband radio. Um, there's my radio. Um, you can set that up with a Pactor modem, and again, you can, you can download some grid files and, and charts from that too, as well as communicate with folks you know, further in VHF range and communicate with guys around the world and pick up weather forecasts and information and then also talk back, um, which, is, which is fantastic. So um, for, the other thing I didn't um, have on here is I've got a setup with my chart plotter where I, I, I've got a, a satellite receiver and I can receive from there, I can receive and overlay some of these, um, the weather faxes onto my, onto my chart. And I don't have to have those things, all right? So I just have a satellite. Uh, I've got the, the Raymarine version that hooks in the Raymarine chart plotter, okay? So that's really helpful. So you get, find a means to get weather offshore. Uh, purchase a weather routing system. If you're, you know, um, not confident, and we talked about building your confidence. I don't usually use them now. But I've, I've listened to these guys and followed them for, for a long time. This is Chris Parker from the Marine Weather Center. Um, he's one of the uh, real well-known ones, and I've listened to him for years. He's a really brilliant guy. If, um, but you can, you can pay for a specific trip, and then if you have one of those means I just showed you, he will communicate with your vessel and tell you, will, and, and it can be really specific to you. You can tell him you know, who's on board, hey, we're looking for um, some nice weather. They'll route you around difficult stuff or difficult systems, okay? And they'll tell you when to go and when to stop. Like you get a window of a day or so to get going. If you don't leave now, you're going to want to wait like two or three or four more days. So it's really good to have. Um, you can purchase them for a specific trip or get a, 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 a subscription service if you're going to be cruising for an extended period of time, okay? Uh, here's some more. Chris Parker on Marine Weather. Uh, Stephanie Ball from Medio Gib. That's um, her service, uh, Sebastian. Um, Sebastian, um, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. From I think he's a European guy, uh, Vetter Velt. I think that's him. So uh, those are 
folks that, that um, are, are pretty well known and established in the industry. There's a lot of other ones you can get to, but those are some guys I'd recommend. So this is um, us in Great Bridge Lock. All right. Question over there in the back. Um, we just talked about that. It's, it's, I don't know enough about it to speak to it, okay? Um, I would definitely look into it. Um, they do have a marine offshore version. I know some people that are using the mobile version for their, we talked about this earlier, they're using the mobile version to receive information. Um, um, but I, I, I don't know if that works well enough while you're moving. Um, I know they get to the islands and have plenty of internet and stuff. So um, definitely look into it. And as the technology gets better, I would definitely use it. Okay, um, this is us in Great Bridge Lock, and the reason is is because we uh, you know, we got this great offshore boat with all the equipment, all the stuff, and um, we were looking at our, our our models and going, you know, we're not going to go around Hatteras this time. Okay, we're going to go on the inside, and that's because the forecast I got was that, and I'm like, ah. Eh. Let's go down the ICW and then we'll pop out in Beaufort or something, you know. And if you know, the, the Gulf Stream comes flowing right through here, so I've got wind against the Gulf Stream. And if you've ever done that before, you probably haven't done it a second time, right? Um, it gets exciting out there. It doesn't mean we can't do it. This isn't a, like, to, too extreme, but, but it would be very, very uncomfortable. And we just opted to, you know, let's just go through the ICW. And as much as I hate you know, 10, 12 hours in the day looking at marks and going by and going by and just want to get out. We're just kind of itching to get offshore. There's times to just call it a day. And either wait where you are or um, transit a different way, okay? And then, and then head, head off. Um, this is what they talk about, about the Gulf Stream. Here's a, the, the model. This was from um, yesterday, the um, 17, 2023. Yeah, um, so this was valid yesterday. Um, this is the Gulf Stream on the, on, on the East Coast, mid-Atlantic, and you can see how it's really ripping up through here. So if you're heading down and you're hugging the coast, kind of two routes you have to, to, to go is either you're gonna head the, um, hug the coast all the way down, which is, you know, the ocean's not dangerous, it's just a little bit around the edges that's a problem, okay? So once you're out there, you're good, so you just have to be very vigilant in your navigating, especially around Hatteras. Again, a fun thing to Google if you got some free time is, is um, you know, yacht, you, you know, yacht goes down around, yacht sinks around Hatteras, and it's like you'll have lots of ones to choose from to pick and read about. Um, so you have to hug the coast, and you still have, the blue is about what we experienced in Chesapeake Bay, a knot or less, but, um, but you're getting over here, and it's, it's ripping three, four knots. You know, it's really moving. And especially if you've got that weather that was pointing against it, that's going to make it a big deal. Now, what I'll try to do is, um, if I'm going to hug around here, um, again, I want to probably cross, maybe come in this way and cross it where it's not quite so strong. Uh, there is a part that's outside Charleston where it kind of loops, loops around and goes more of a northeast rather than um, just, you know, stronger northeast to north. So this is like head due north. I don't want to get in here and end up back where I came from. So I'll come out of Charleston and head across, getting this and then ride up and then come down. Or if I cross higher up, you can try to ride these back eddies. Here's this an eddy coming down. You can ride this current going down south. Watch out for this one. But if you get over here, you can ride this current again um, down, down south. So I'm riding these, the, the Gulf Stream current, riding the back eddies on the current. And how do you figure all that out? We can go back to the weather, the, the weather routers. They will help you with that. They will tell you the date. And this is a daily model. This isn't constant. You can't chart this thing and have it on your chart and go, well, this is where I'm going because it changes from day to day, okay? So if you're not you know, proficient to it yourself, get a weather router and say, hey, I'd like to, um, to um, do this trip and I'd like you to, to route me through it. This is the southern portion, yes. Yeah. And they come in through the ICW and uh -huh. they come out. So how far in your experience, how far off do you come off when you when you travel that area in Cape Hatteras? How far off do you go? Like are you off like twenty miles? Are you off thirty miles off from from where you come off? Like if you come off 
Buford, Beaufort, mm -hmm. and you come out and you just kind of come out and go to Norfolk. How far out do you come out before you make the turn into Norfolk? Uh, it depends on the weather. Okay, if it's the rougher it is, the farther out I want to go. Okay, um, you, there's a bunch of different shoals that are around yeah. this region right here. Yes. So you want to be well south of shoals. There's also some buoys out there, and there's also some you know old towers and structures that are out there that you want to be, be you know avoid. So um, you know it depends on where I'm going. If I'm heading down, I think I got another another view of this. But but um, if I'm not coming out and getting past it and heading down, um, I'm going to probably be. I want to say the, the closest I'd want to be is maybe 20 miles, all right? But even there, you know, I, I try to be enough offshore where within one watch, we're not going to totally screw up and end up on the beach, okay? So you could have one watch where somebody can fall asleep or something and you're still going to be alive, all right? Um, so yeah, but you, you know, it's, it's a challenge because you don't have a whole lot. You maybe have like, you know, um, 40 miles, 50 miles the most before you're feeling the effects of the Gulf Stream. So going south is a challenge. Um, down here, a lot of times people will um, go to the ICW all the way to Florida and then want to hop across to the Bahamas, right? Uh, the problem with that is this is it's really honking right through the um, between Florida and the islands. It just really funnels through there. So the plan would be to go down to South Florida, maybe um, you know Lake Worth or something. Yeah, Fort Lauderdale area, and then you know, aim and kind of right up this way, and then back down to the Bahamas. But that's a challenge; it's hard to do. Okay, um, the like again, I'd rather rather than fight it all the way down, try to go on the inside. I'd rather cross and then come down there. But that's going to put you at sea for several days, right? Depending on the speed of your boat. All right. Um, you can also watch these and try to ride these currents down. All right, like I was showing you up there, there's just the southern, southern part of the, the same chart. So uh, I like to cross where it's the least, least strong, um, like in here, in here, but I probably don't want to wait to get down into Florida and then try to cross here because you, you just end up so much. I had a buddy in Palm Beach. He's like, um, he was selling a sailboat. I was like, why are you selling your sailboat? He's like, well, I go out of Palm Beach Harbor, I head south. I sail all day, then I turn around and go back in the inlet. <laughs> and they go, I tried sailing north one time, and I end up in St. Augustine. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, he's like, I'm gonna get a powerboat. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. So, you know, look at, you do have those two options uh, going down. Either hug the coast, it's nice because it does allow you to get in and visit different places or get out of bad weather. It's a big commitment to come across and drop all the way down. Um, my last trip, I met someone in the, in, in the islands. And they were like, oh, it took us like a month to get here. And we were sailing and stuff. I'm like, a month? It took me five days. Where, where'd you go? <laughs> and, and we just kind of like, you know, went out, went out of the Chesapeake Bay, went straight down. And um, the problem is a lot of boats, because you know, the trade winds come from the east, you get stuck over here. You can't. You get out. You're going to work your way back into the wind. It was just. It, it was just too rough for like several weeks on end. Um, but it was fine offshore as long as you weren't trying to go east. Okay, going south was beautiful. It's like you know, 20, 25 knots off the beam, and we just, we just sailed on down. So um, this is tells you the. Uh, this is another weather facts chart. This is um, from Bermuda. They've got really good weather information. Um, Bermuda's up here, so again, um, I wouldn't mind the route going from Chesapeake Bay out to Bermuda. If I'm heading down, like say, further in the Caribbean, um, I'm gonna go from Chesapeake Bay to Bermuda, and then I'm gonna drop down, and you see I've got like a broad reach or beam reach, like all the way down. I can come all the way into, um, you know, BVIs or something, and the trade winds are always on my beam. Problem is, um, you know, you're gonna have to spend two weeks at sea, about a week or so, Getting to uh, getting to Bermuda, and about another week to ten days getting down to um, the BVIs. What most people will do is we call this the thorny path, right? That's kind of the nickname for it, where you're you're coming down here to Florida, and you can make it all the way to South America and never spend more than one or two nights at sea, which is great, except for you got to go through the thorny path, and it's an upwind slog the whole way. And there's some there's some strategies to do it. Right? Um, I forgot the guy's name. He wrote a book, uh, Gentleman's Guide to the Thorny Path or something. 
um, about his, his strategies for doing it. Something this is great, but it, it's just work, working your way upwind. I'd much rather you know, sail out to Bermuda, then drop straight down, and then you know, work your way up and enjoy the trip, kind of like on a broad reach, because the trade winds are like this. It's, you see it's blowing 20 knots, and it's kind of like that almost every day um, in the trade winds, all right? So, and that's their route. That's the way, and they call it the trade winds because they'd come across from, from Europe. They'd um, come across the southern route here, go up the island chain, and then go home back that way, right? Because it's all, um, it's much easier wind-wise and currents. And like we were showing you the, um, that one, it's much easier getting home. You just kind of like jump in, the, jump in the Gulf Stream. You can just ride it up north, you know? And there's great fishing there, man. It's fantastic. That's why um, we'll get that in a second. But um, so weather routing, mechanical electrical skills. So we, we can go on forever and ever about weather routing and navigation and everything. We do whole classes on it. But just to kind of, you know, get you to start thinking about what sources you want to gather and what, um, what subjects you want to brush up on. And, and possibly I'd really recommend for, for a first-time trip, go ahead and get a weather router. Um, Okay, attempt to fix issues before hiring a professional. It's easy to make the phone call. Say, hey, will you fix that thing? It's not working. Um, I always recommend try to fix it yourself first. If you screw it up, it was already broken. <laughs> okay? So you got to hire somebody anyway. But there's a chance that you could fix it. And then if you can fix it, then you've just gained in your ability, right? You had to figure it out. That's going to allow you more confidence to be somewhere a little bit further away, all right? A little bit further away. We, uh, so build your library. Again, here's the first book you want to get if you don't have this. This is the best one to have, Mechanical Electrical Manual. It covers the most subjects and the most detail. And then you can build from there, get books on specific things. But this will cover mechanical, electrical, plumbing, um, you know, everything. It's fantastic. So it's a really good reference book to have aboard. Um, let me go, so build your library, build your toolkit. I would say build your toolkit as you start fixing things. Don't go out and just buy a bunch of tools, but know what they do and how to use them. I've got a toolkit on board for every different system on my boat, whether it's you know, electrical or plumbing or mechanical, um, whether it's rigging, all those kind of things are in separate places and separate kits. But I built them over time of learning how to do certain jobs and like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this tool here. Uh, build your spare parts inventory. Uh, one of our captains was down on our boat in the, in the islands, called me, and he goes, hey, the, um, the house water system isn't working. What do I do? I'm like, well, if you go into the locker right over here, that one, go in the, inside there, reach way down, pull a bunch of stuff out. At the very bottom, there's a new water pump. Pull that out and install it. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so, um, you know, how do I know to carry a spare water pump? Is because I've been in a remote area and my water pump went down and I had all kinds of cool fresh water in my tanks but I couldn't get it out. So I'm like, oh, I'm gonna <coughs> carry a spare water pump. I carry things like a spare alternator. We were doing a, um, a 106 class on the Delmarva circumnavigation. We do that too, we go around Delmarva. And um, we were monitoring, one person, um, students was on watch, they are monitoring our electrical system, realized uh, even though the engine was on at the time, we weren't charging. Like, oh, we're not charging, so our alternator had gone out. And so we didn't have a spare alternator. Actually, we, uh, no, we didn't have a spare alternator aboard. And so we had to, had to stop and pull into a port and hunt one down. And then we had a, a cool install um, alternator class going on for, for about an hour or two. So that was kind of fun. But, uh, but start building what spare parts do you want in inventory aboard. Uh, st watch standing. Get, you know, um, work on watching. There's a good looking sailor right there. Yeah, um, so avoid fatigue, drowsiness. Get good. And a lot of times when I'm, we're, we're um, on watch or we're rotating through, if I'm off watch, man, I'm, I want to sleep because I want to sleep as much as I can, so I'm attentive why I'm on watch. But uh, decide on a watch schedule. I find if um, I'm pretty good with four on, four off. I don't like three on, three off because I, it's just it's not enough time for me to get some really good sound sleep. Um, I love having enough people aboard. If you've got three people um, on board or more, you can do multiple people on watch. I love doing four, um, three watches, so you're, you're, you're four on, eight off. That's my favorite one. And you can get some to eat, you can you know, get cleaned up, you know, hang out, read a book, whatever you want to do. But um, being on four hours and then um, off for eight, that allows you to go around the clock and have the same schedule every day, okay? 
the three on three off is kind of rotating around the clock and it's a different time every day and you just have to readjust almost every day so I like doing the four on eight off if you can all right that's my uh, four on four off yeah. yeah that's what you kind of have to do right so that's what I like doing I mean, you can do three or do, do six um, I do have on here communicate watch responsibilities and the last one would be be flexible uh, we'll get through that in a second. We'll go back. Be flexible, right? I, um, <clears throat> I was coming up to my watch one time, and um, one of my sons was with me on this trip, and, and, and his eyes are like all wide and stuff, and I'm like, you okay? He's like, yeah, I just drank a Red Bull. <laughs> I haven't had one in a while, but I'm awake. I'm like, all right, well, you good for a while? He's like, I'm great. Yeah, yeah, I'm awake. I'm like, I'm going to go back to bed. <laughs> He's like, okay. I'm like, if you get tired, let me know, you know. So be flexible. It's good to have a schedule, you know, to keep to. But, you know, if, if someone's awake, let them go on for a little bit longer. Um, or if it's rough, if someone's uncomfortable, say, okay, why not, well, let me take the, the rougher schedule, and then you can, when it calms down, then you can um, come on back up. So communicate, watch responsibilities. What do you do on watch? All right? You get up there, and you sit there, and the autopilot's on. It's like, hmm. All right, now what? Well, we have a whole list of things you want to do, and this is what we use for our classes. Um, number one, there's a bunch of responsibilities. There's some responsibilities that are kind of off, side, off of your boat and then onboard responsibilities. And the biggest thing is, um, you know, detect and avoid ships, debris, or <laughs> hazards in water. All right, so my number one rule for being on watch is don't hit anything. All right, it's a simple rule, all right? All you got to do, don't hit anything. Navigation can come second, but don't, kill, don't wreck the boat, all right? So looking around, and always remember, from sailboat speed with container ships, it takes 20 minutes from a container ship to be over the horizon where you can't see it, okay, to be up on you. And they're silent. You will not hear them. So 20 minutes from not seeing it to being up on you, and that's all it takes, okay, to get run down. So... Every 10 minutes on watch, have your little watch timer go off, bing, 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 stand up, stretch, turn around, watch is 360 degrees, all right? Look around behind you. Oh, all right, nobody back there? Good, all right? So watch means watch. And then a bunch of other things, um, monitor weather, you're doing other things, do bilge checks. There's a section of the logbook we go, hey, I want everybody on watch to do a bilge check. I don't want to find out that we've got a problem when um, you know we've got lots of water, I want to figure out the problem. We have a little bit of water coming in. Okay, so if you monitor that every few hours, that's really important. Um, so there's a lot of internal yacht responsibilities, such as um, bilge check. Go ahead and do your, um, you know, if you if you do a sail change or whatever, um, don't, don't try to do that by yourself. So communicate watch responsibilities. Um, here's one of our cruise planning logs. Every watch puts an entry in and gives information about what's going on with their watch. And let me see anything else. Okay, first aid CPR, <coughs> take a class, um, build your CPR skills, build your first aid skills. If, you know, you know bring a suture kit, that's, that's kind of nice to have for, for larger lacerations, smaller stuff, you can have a normal CTR, um, CPR kit or a first aid kit. Um, get certified, keep that up to date. There's new things, new information coming out all the time. If, um, you get a suture kit and take a class on it or practice. That's a great idea to have somebody who has that ability aboard. You can also get the, you know, the, the sticky stuff that will stick wounds together and things. Yes? How do you get a suture kit? You just go to CVS and say, I need some suture kit. Uh, you, can, you can order them online. Yeah. I guess you could get, I don't, I've never ordered got them through CVS before, but I've bought them through medical supply places. Um, I've got them on, on Amazon. You can get them on Amazon. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, fishing. Let's add fishing, all right? Um, you know, you're, you're transiting some great waters like the, like, you know, the Gulf Stream. There's some great fish out there, so why not trail a line, right? So if, we're, if it's fairly calm, if it's really rough, we're not going to be trying to land a fish and, and, and clean it and we're, you know, bobbing like a cork out there. But if it's, you know, nice weather, we're always trailing lines. We're not going after fish, but if they, they happen to find us, that's fantastic. So... Uh, always, you know, bring some gear, upgrade your stuff, make sure you have um, stuff. Provisioning, you know, um, if, you, if you start scraping the bottom of the, the locker, right, you're going to, you know, end up with mac and cheese and spam, which is, which is a fine meal in my opinion, okay? There's nothing wrong with this whatsoever. But, but we try to provision well. 
Um, most of the time, wherever you go, if there's people, you're going to find food. All right, good rule of thumb. But what you're not going to find all the time is all like you know the spices and the preparation stuff. So I stock up, and I talk about provisioning. I'll provision meals for the trip, but make sure you have. I'll really stock up on like you know like you know spices or sauces or you know all, all the kind of things that go into making 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 stuff. And you're gonna find you're gonna find good meals. So you know, here's some here's some sushi we made offshore. We cut a nice tuna, and we're like, okay, fresh sushi it is. So we carry our you know our, our our sushi rice and some wasabi and the little rolling mat thing, you know, and and we and the seaweed wrappers. We do it right. So, um, and here's a pizza we baked offshore. So you know, we we we're not gonna we we, we don't want to rough it. Okay, we we enjoy this because we do it because it's fun. Um, you know, on the islands, you can always get a nice big lobster or two. And there's a buddy of mine, my daughter. We were having a nice lobster dinner that night. We had had a successful day spear fishing. Um, here we are with, you know, making whatever local stuff we had added to our, um, all of our stores aboard. We can add some fresh meat or fresh food to it or fresh, um, fresh seafood. But, you know, we carry tons of tortillas. I don't know what's in the tortilla brand I buy, but... Those things last for like a year or more. <laughs> I mean, I left my boat in the I, no, I'm most down there now, and I bought like extra. I might get back. You know, I'm, I'm flying down in a couple weeks to do some classes, and then so, so, and the tortillas will be great. Like, don't mold. I'm like, we're gonna make these to out of, right? The Thomas's Thomas's English muffins. I'm I'm surprised they're edible because they they don't go bad. So load up with that kind of stuff, right? And they're, they're, they're a little bit harder to find in the islands and stuff. Here is a lobster meat omelet that we, um, we made, okay? So again, if you carry some packets of hollandaise sauce, you know, that, that, that same little packet you get for a buck fifty here is going to be like, you know, six or seven dollars in the islands, okay? So, yeah. Maybe you should open the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> My crew eats well. <laughs> Um, one time we were doing a 106. Um, one time we were doing a, like a, a, a 106 in the bay here. We we caught some like rockfish during rockfish season, so we were, we had fresh rockfish. You weren't on that trip, were you? Yeah. No. You. <laughs> um, this is our offshore boat. Um, that's sitting down there right now. You can kind of see all the stuff we've got on it. And why do we do all this? Is because I want to anchor my boat in places like that. Okay. So there she is, sitting in a beautiful anchorage off the nice, beautiful beach in nice, calm water. And it's just absolutely fun. It's worth going through all the trouble, doing all, get, you know, upgrading your boat, getting the stuff and provisioning. And it's just really beautiful to be down places like this. Sometimes they have really good days and fishing. So this has nothing to do with, you know, offshore sailing. It's just, you know, <laughs> going to end with a nice little picture here. Um, and there's us, you know, cruising right along, um, having a great time. So we'll, we'll, end on, we'll end on that picture there. Right there. <laughs> Um, we have a little bit of time for questions. Is that okay? For you? Oh, yeah. Any, any, any questions? Yes, yes. Is that Corbin 39? It is a Corbin 39. Yes, it is. We had, um, you know, I've sailed for years, and, and I should have some interior pictures, but I don't. But to get a boat with a pilot house was a huge eye-opener for me. I'm like, why don't more boat builders build pilot houses? And, and rough weather to be able to go inside and close your hatch and turn the, you know, the diesel heater on and just like, why haven't I done this? So yeah, it's the Corbin 39. We had a couple do the trip with us a few years ago down to the islands and stuff. It was really funny. They flew back home and bought a Corbin 39. Um, and they're, they're, they haven't made them in a long time, but yes. Uh, I'm a troll guy, so forgive me. Okay. Um, when you're going Bermuda or down to the bottom, mm -hmm. Is there such thing as an average speed? What do, what do you guys, when you're sailing, what do you, what's a normal cruise? Um, going down, I'm going about seven, eight knots. That's good. Coming up, I'm doing in the Gulf Stream, I can do 10, 11, you know, because I'm getting a boost from the stream. All right. So yeah, not, not, not a whole different from the trial. I, I've got to, you know, I, I, I play a sailor guy at work, right? Um, I'm a power motor too. <laughs> You know, I've got a 53 foot, you know, um, powerboat, right? Um, the only problem is it costs me about 30 grand to get to, to the Bahamas. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I take a sailboat <laughs> and I, I lounge around on our, you know, on our nice powerboat, you know, Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> we always catch up to the trawlers. 
It's only a little later in the day. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like, it is a lot, there's a lot to be said for trawlers. I love trawlers, you know, I absolutely do. So, yes. Can you talk about positioning jack lines because you want them taut and not too close to the lifelines so that you don't go over and you're hanging by your harness? Yeah. Like what, what, what do you recommend? Okay, so I have them going down, like I showed you a picture of the setup there. Uh, I have big pad eyes that are bolted through, bolted to the boat. That's gonna be my aft anchorage point on both sides, okay? You want them on both sides, don't stick them on one side. You're gonna send them um, under all of your, your running rigging, okay? On deck, as close inboard as you can, okay? Under all your running rigging up to the bow of the boat, and I'll usually tie it to my bow cleats, okay? And that's the way I'm gonna run it. Now, I'm always traveling on deck, I'm always on my windward side, okay? So if I'm, you know, that way if I do stumble and fall, I'm falling downhill, okay? And it's gonna catch me before I go in the water. So the trick is being on the windward side. Being on the windward side, yes. Okay. So you don't have to worry too much. About correct, it. correct, yep. And you don't have to have little attachment points so that you have to take your tether off and reattach. I it. do because I've got a preventer system set up that I, that I have to get around. Uh -huh. And so on my, I don't have mine because it's on the boat right now, but it, it has two hooks on it. Right, so you So never, I can do like that spacewalk thing or you're like a chink, you know, ka chink, you know, right. can work your way down. Okay. All right. Um, on a catamaran, what I'd recommend is going from the two sterns, crossing in front of your mast with both of them and going to opposite sides. That's how I'd run that. That way you can, um, it's not along the edge of the, the hull the whole time. All right. So you're kind of like walking forward, but then you're kind of crossing over. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. What are your thoughts of leaving your dinghy in, on the stern? Um, in, you know, on your stern. Do you like, oh. like when you go offshore? Yeah. I mean, we've gone offshore and we've left it, you know, you know, on our stern. But it moves around a lot. Yeah. So do you? Do, is it like a breaker I get to just, you know, take it down and put it, you know, towards more towards the bow than leaving it in the stern? Yeah. Um, it depends on how high your davits are. It really does. Like I, we, we've got Davis on the back of our boat. We crank it all the way up, take everything out, take the engine off so it's super, super light. And I will leave it off. But then again, I've been offshore going, you look at these waves coming behind you going, don't take my D, you know? <laughs> so it, it can, if you get, you know, um, water over the stern, it can rip your boat out and, and take it, take it. It depends on how long you're going to be offshore. If I'm just hopping across like the Bahamas or something, I'll leave it on. Yeah. If I'm going to cross the Atlantic, I'm probably going to take it off the Davis and lash it down the foredeck. Upside down. I made the mistake in the bay of just, you know, and then between islands, I'm towing it, right? Because I don't want to bring it up and down the whole time. I made this mistake in the Chesapeake Bay. We were doing, um, we're sailing up the bay and we were towing the dinghy. We got hit by a, you know, a squall. It's like blowing, I don't know, 40, 45 knots. And, you know, dinghy's like a kite swinging around like this in the air. You're like, eh, that's not good. So, <laughs> so even in that case, you know, take the engine off and take things out, right? So, um, so yeah, if, if it's settled weather and it's not, it doesn't look too bad, then I would, I would leave it up on the davits. Well, on your experience, what's the wind speed like that where you see now you've, like, you've gotten into like, trouble? Like, we haven't experienced winds over 13, but we've never done 20, and I know that we were going offshore, so yeah. it's like, you know, math equations, so yeah. is it like, yeah, if you're going to experience winds more than 20, take it down, or you go like 13? See, the trick is knowing what you're going to experience. Yeah, well, you never know. You know, you really don't. So you have to plan for the worst, right? And you know, sailing offshore, doesn't matter which way direction, you're going to have to, you're always going to have 30 knots on the bow. No matter how well <laughs> weather forecasting, which direction you go, even you change course, the wind changes with you, 30 knots right off the bow. <laughs> so, I, um, you know, I, I think if, you know, yeah, 20, 25 foot seas, I'm probably not going to want to have that, that dinghy on the back. You know, and I've, and I've been about there and about that where it's, I've been on the borderline going, gosh, I wish I had, I, I had lashed that thing down the foredeck. You know? Yeah. Okay. Yes, in the back. Uh, Watermakers. Yes. Um, fresh water in the islands usually going to pay about 30 cents a gallon, right? So, and the water maker I put on my boat was probably like, by the time it was installed, it was like, I don't know, about seven or $8,000 investment. I can buy a lot of water for seven or $8,000, 30 cents a gallon. So, um, you know, have enough tanks 
to, to make it there, which you should, and monitor your water. We're not taking full showers offshore, you know, we're you know, just kind of sponge baths and getting cleaned up. But, um, but you should have enough to make it for a week or two at sea with what your, what your tankage is. Uh, it's nice having a water maker, um, but you can, you'll always be in places to fill up. Um, usually, if you go to really remote areas, sometimes the, yeah, the Southern Bahamas, it gets real sparse. So it's, it's nice to have, it's, um, but then again, it's another, it's another thing to, to, to monitor, and it's, a, it's also a power hog, right? Um, how are you gonna power that thing? And on the, the boat um, my family used to live on, we had enough solar panels where we knew between 10 and two every day that we could turn on the water maker and that could, the solar panels could run the water maker and everything, we wouldn't have to, try, we wouldn't have to run the engine. Uh, and that was really nice, and so that allowed us a lot. So what, what it does when you do have it, it does allow you a little bit more freedom, okay? So you don't have to plan, you don't always have to leave to go fill up your tanks if you're in a beautiful spot. So it's, it's very convenient, but I, um, I wouldn't let not having one be a limiting, limiting factor. Okay, yes, anybody else? Yes? So I was watching on Marine Tracker a pattern of boats that leave Key Biscayne to get to the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And they all tend to wait for the weather window. Yeah. And all of a sudden, boom, like, you know, 50 boats go across at the same time. Yeah. What's that phenomenon I'm looking at? It, you know, it looks like favorable conditions. They could leave at 7 in the morning. They could be drinking uh, daiquiris by 3 in the afternoon. Yeah. What, uh, what conditions make that possible? They're looking for a nice south wind, okay? Because it's a south wind is going with the Gulf Stream, not against it, and probably 10 knots or less, and the seas lay down, and they'll be like maybe, I don't know, two or three feet offshore, and everybody's like, <gasps> now's the time, and they go. <laughs> it's like a big parade. It is a big parade going out. And, everybody leaves at once. You know, and the other thing is, you know, following the crowd, I'd, I'd always, you know, you, Following the crowd, they're not on your insurance, okay? And everybody's got an opinion out there, so you wanna trust your own judgment. And I've seen the crowd go, and I'm not going. And they're like, well, come along, everybody else going. I'm like, mm-mm. And it's a beautiful day, why not? Like, I, I just don't wanna go. <laughs> and, and then after the trip, when I finally get there, like, man, that was a terrible trip. This happened and that happened. Like, yeah, it's too bad, huh? <laughs> and then I've had times where they're like, oh, it's terrible. We're not leaving for, we got to wait another week until the weather gets good. And we're like, well, we're leaving in about an hour. So we'll see you guys, you know, and we'll take off. And, and they won't go, you know, but I know my boat. I know my, the, the weather. I'm pretty getting, getting more confident, you know, in my decisions. So uh, be careful of that. A lot of times everybody moves in big packs. Right, and you can get in trouble doing that. So, all right, uh, one more in the back. Yes. Well, just one thing I think you know, every cruise is taken into account when they go offshore, and they're going to hit bad weather, they're going to get high seas, they're going to hit mechanical breakdowns. And rule number one for me is the crew has to be considerate to tanks to be tough. Yes. Yeah. And if somebody's busy working on the engine during, during uh, their off watch, you might stand a couple hours more watch and then you've got a chance to get rested and sleep. Mm -hmm. And it's easy for things to escalate if you start getting sarcastic with another crew member and they strike back. Toward. That's a very small space to deal with. Uh, Right. Mm -hmm. That's 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 good advice right there. Yep. Yep. We've had trips where you know people were excited to part ways at the end of the trip. You know, and then we've had trips where we've just really, you know, everybody's really bonded together and had a great time, and it becomes a really memorable memorable experience. So. Um, I, um, let me finish with, with one quick story, and then I'll be around. If you have more questions, I'll, I'll be around for a little bit after, afterwards. But um, the, my weather forecast for the wave height is always two to three feet, okay? It, this is always two to three feet. So we'll get out there, and my wife will be, what are these waves looking a little bigger? What are they? I'm like, I don't know about two to three feet. <laughs> and she's like, we're <laughs> she's like, but we're on a... Um, yeah, like it looks a little bit bigger. I'm like, no, it's, it's, it's only about two or three feet. You measure from the back of the wave, you know, hon. You know, I kind of, you know, I don't look at the face. I'm from the back of the wave. And she's like, yeah, but we're, 
where the catamaran? I'm like, yeah. She's like, well, you know, the bridge deck is like, you know, three, three feet off the water. I'm like, yeah. And she's like, well, then the helm is like another three or four feet off of that. I'm like, yeah. And she's like, we're standing up there and we're kind of looking up six feet. And she's adding all these numbers. And how come I'm looking up at the wave, you know? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's about two or three feet. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much for coming. If you have any questions, I'll be around for you. Specifically in that one spot, the trade winds, once you're in the Caribbean, the trade winds are about from the east about 15 to 20 almost every day. Um, I haven't taken mine, one of our captains has, and he's, he had it there, gosh, I think he's coming back up now. Yeah, give me your name and number, and he's, he's coming this way. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. Sometime this spring time. Yeah. <laughs> um, it can be anything. It can be anything. Um, I don't have a pen. Oh, there's one. Um, just look at those weather facts charts, you know, and um, I don't think they start measuring at under nine feet, right? So it's like nine to 12 or something like that will be the, the lowest they'll measure, okay? Yeah, I used to predict wind. Uh -huh. 